So that was the plenary opening, day one of the Re-AIM Summit. I feel like we all need to take a breather. So much robust debate, so much disagreement, so many sensitive issues as well, um, so many areas of expertise to be explored. But we just heard Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman talking about the broader elements of AI, and it almost felt like he was bringing all the warring parties, excuse that particular pun, together. But so much has just been said um, in this particular uh, opening uh, a session and um, we remember also the words of the foreign minister who talked about AI that it might just soon exceed our combined expertise so what do we do with that he emphasized that we need an international system that is built on law we've got different um, uh, approaches to how we make law and so on. But there were some very emotive, emotive elements uh, to that, especially an acknowledgement that war is dirty. Some impassioned interventions by Dr. Agnes Kalamad, SG of Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. But the other panelists didn't quite deny that war is dirty. It was about perhaps to use children's languages, since I'm a mother of small children, how do we ensure that the goodies are ahead of the game? Well, to still help us make sense of these uh, conversations and to help us really center uh, uh, ourselves so that we really deal with the substantive issues, we still have Kirsten Vignard and Michael Ruska, who are experts in this field. I'm not sure if that clip is ready yet, uh, just to remind ourselves of that area of, of, of disagreement and the point of debate. Perhaps I'll just pause for just a few seconds as we remind ourselves of uh, the contestation. What are your expectations of today and tomorrow, these coming day days of the conference? Well, I think you said it already. We got a lot of stakeholders here who have different ideas about using AI, and I think that is the first uh, good thing, that we put it on the table, um, because I think we have all one goal and one course, and that is uh, using a reliable, on a reliable way, uh, AI and on a trustworthy way. Uh, so that we make sure that the, that the human is in the loop at the, right, at the right moments. But also, I think we should also put on the table and have that discussion on the defense side. War is dirty. Our opponents will use AI, and perhaps not under the same strict regulations as we will do. So we have to find also solutions at the moments that uh, we have to defend ourselves uh, in circumstances that uh, we have to use AI faster than perhaps we would like. Thank you. And we'll hear later where Amnesty International stands on this. But Michael, is that a fair reflection of where we are? Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a, it's a very, you know, as I mentioned it earlier in the discussion, the technology is moving much faster than our ability to understand and its implications and our ability to actually find, uh, you know, uh, regulations that would uh, mitigate some of the risks. And I think the debate that we saw in the plenary is, is precisely about that. It's about where do we find the thresholds for contentious use of uh, uh, AI and it's not just about AI it's uh, you know other technologies as well and so every uh, stakeholder in this would probably give you a different answer where the red lines are where is the spectrum right from non-contentious to very high contentious military applications of AI so for example if I have a, a autonomous uh, robot uh, kind of that you have here on, on a picture that is tasked to evacuate uh, combatants from the battlefield right so you will send that robot to evacuate uh, wounded soldiers right is that a contentious uh, military applications of AI most people would probably say no right but if you have the same robot that is tasked, you know, to identify uh, targets and basically autonomously make decisions who to kill, that is contentious. So I think different uh, parties will have a different ideas on, you know, where the thresholds, uh, where the red lines are. And the problem is the technologies, again, are evolving so much faster and there's uh, so much uh, applications of that that uh, it is very difficult to draw, uh, you know, the red lines. But for me personally, if I was to ask, you know, where the summit, why we're sitting here today, is about really to create the roadmap for the future of AI and, and military affairs. This is just the start starting point of the conversation. We cannot have a conclusion at the summit here, mm. but we have to have an ongoing conversation, identify you know, the risks and, and, and provide answers uh, uh, to them how to mitigate this risk. Mm. So there sometimes seems to be a, an unequal, as it were, um, focus on autonomous weapon systems, mm -hmm. but that's not all there is to it, isn't it? Do you think that uh, 
we, we are challenged to address AI then in its broader sense. If that's the case, what should we then incorporate in our discussions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, 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 there is a lot of focus and, uh, on autonomous weapon systems, but we have to remind ourselves the international community mm. has been discussing autonomous weapon systems within the framework of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons at the UN for almost 10 years now. And so this is not new. Mm. Um, I'm, uh, it would have been nice that we'd made more progress on this discussion, but we have an opportunity now not just to focus on autonomous weapon systems, which I think is a more probably the most familiar topic, mm -hmm. the one that's certainly gotten the most press um, and there's loud voices in that debate. We have an opportunity now to talk about that whole range. You just mm -hmm. brought up some wonderful you know, examples of that. And uh, can I just talk a little bit about the scenarios? Of course. Can I bring it to mm -hmm. the scenarios for a moment? Um, I think scenarios are a great way to help um, it's creative to help us get us thinking about some of the hard issues that lie before us, some of the trade-offs that mm -hmm. we're going to have to consider um, as we, as we um, incorporate AI into our militaries. Um, but they also project us, they parachute us, mm -hmm. in fact, into a future moment, usually confronted with a dilemma, right? And, and they ask us, what would you do in this situation? We, we have to think about that. What would I do? But we need to be careful about what we take away from, from mm -hmm. future scenarios. Um, future scenarios and um, exercises always kind of remind me of the Talking Heads song, uh, Once in a Lifetime, where, you know, you say, how did I get here, mm -hmm. right? I am, what were the decisions that led us to this moment? What were the design decisions? What were the policy decisions? What were the legal decisions? What were the international negotiations? Where, how did we get mm. to this moment today where I am being asked by a commander, mm. should we rely on this system, mm -hmm. right? We can work backwards from that, but we can also, and I think what we, we need to do now is work forwards. We need to develop that roadmap. We need to identify what responsible AI looks like. I think we have a good basis for that with international principles about responsible AI. They're not all the same. There's different kind of groupings, but there's a lot of overlap. We need to translate those principles, those high level ideas into practice. What does it mean to be governable? What does it mean to be governable of this system in this circumstance, in this situation, within this domain, right? right. That is hard work and it's not work that necessarily needs to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. We need technologists at the table, mm -hmm. for sure. We need lawyers, we need ethicists, we need all those people. But we need to be working forward, not just working mm -hmm. from the future and trying to regulate or think about, how would I deal with that? We need to be building something, mm -hmm. constructing something. And I think we, we, we need not just to look at autonomous weapon yeah. systems, decision yeah. support tools, um, mm -hmm. humanitarian relief. Our, mm -hmm. our militaries are often called on right. um, to, to deal with humanitarian catastrophes. You know, how are we gonna leverage AI to protect civilians um, in times of conflict? There's a huge underattended space there okay. that, where that yeah. technology could be used. Michael, when we come back, I do want us to delve into a theme that was uh, close to your heart when that panel discussion mm -hmm. started around risks versus benefits, mm -hmm. which one outweighs mm -hmm. the other. But I think somebody who has nailed her colors to the mouth and is quite unequivocal in her opposition, and we, we do want to hear plurality sure. of voices. I keep saying that because this yeah. is not a combative space, but it is a space of debate and decision making. Mm -hmm. Let's just remind ourselves of some of the anxieties and concerns of civil society represented here by the SG of Amnesty International, Dr. Agnes Kalamant. What, what did she say? And we cannot just, you know, think here in this room there are only good people that are going to use this intelligence um, to defend. This is not the case. Point number one, it will be used to target those individuals, the one running for their life. Point number two, where have you been for the last 70 years? Wars are dirty. Biases are part of warfare. I am working for Amnesty International. I have worked in human rights all my life. There is not one clean war. Wars are full of biases. War are driven by biases. So you are creating a technology that can encode biases, targeting blacks, targeting Jews, targeting refugees, targeting red hair people, targeting, I don't know, people walking in a certain way. That is what this technology can bring in. We cannot clean the war. Wars are dirty and you're creating 
uh, uh, weapons that will make them more lethal, that will make the biases that are part and parcel of war more lethal. Okay, Michael, we can't mm. dismiss what you're mm, saying, right? Course. We're still in this era of post-truth and fake news mm. and, and all of that. And it is changing our industries, particularly mm. mine, of journalism. What is the truth and what isn't? Mm. She's got a point. Mm. Of course, uh, just like also Lawrence Freeman uh, in his remarks. Uh, in, in a sense, the nature of war doesn't change. You have contestation between human wills. Uh, uh, there's a lot of passion, a lot of biases, a lot of destruction, right? Uh, no combat simulation can uh, uh, replace uh, actually the, what what is fighting and and uh, what ha what is happening now, for example, in Ukraine is 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 an excellent uh, a, a example, right? But at the same time, again, you know, this is. Um these technologies are, are, are again, there are a lot of risk and, and uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, in their use, right? But for every innovation, there will always be counter innovation, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the problem is, again, with the diffusion of these technologies, right? You cannot take them out once they are already there. And these technologies are basically prevalent in our civilian lives more than actually the military. So you have to distinguish between, you know, uh, the defense and military innovation, how these technologies are being developed, right? So I am a scientist, engineer, I work, uh, you know, on algorithms, right? Where my job is to make uh, uh, the algorithms as neutral as possible. And at the same time, you have the military decision makers who, and, and military commanders and military forces who try to exploit these technologies in combat, right? So I think here we have to distinguish, you know, between defense and military innovation in a sense. And and just because these technologies out there doesn't mean that they will be used uh, 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 in a restricted way, in a sense, right? So the, the military forces have the responsibility to exploit these technologies within the framework of international humanitarian law, within the framework of, uh, uh, you know, normative uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, in normative ways, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, you yeah, have wars, just like in the, the war in Ukraine shows are uh, extremely uh, brutal, uh, extremely, uh, um, uh, um, you know, deadly. And here is the dilemma is, as when I see, when I look at the wars in Ukraine, for example, where you have technologies from the First World War, you know, you have a trench warfare combined with technologies of the 21st century, century yeah. right? And that is the problem that all these different technologies are merging together. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a sense, the militaries are, don't have the answer, you know, to, uh, to all this, right? All right. Mm -hmm. So Kirsten, as, as we wrap up, uh, it, I'm going back to where we started, then hopes for the summit, how it navigates its way around these contentious issues. The final thoughts. Oh, wow. Um, what do I hope is going to come out of this, this conference? I'm, I'm going to say three things. Um, I want this recognition that responsible AI mm -hmm. is grounded in ethical principles, right? Um, um, that means AI is developed, designed, deployed, and used, aligned mm -hmm. with ethical principles and our legal mm -hmm. commitments. It, you know, in the case of the U.S., for example, it's really telling that they, the DOD announced its ethical principles for AI before its mm -hmm. responsible AI strategy. That AI strategy, uh, responsible AI strategy and implementation pathway is grounded in ethical principles. Mm -hmm. So we need to remember that ethics and our values are at the heart of our technological choices. Secondly, I want to see increased urgency at the national mm -hmm. level to um, develop and adopt responsible AI strategies. Um, it's hard to work collaboratively internationally if you don't have your own house in order, right? And third, I want focused attention on ways of moving principles to practice. We need to take mm. our ethical principles and ideas mm. and operationalize them. And that is where, you know, they say the rubber meets the road. And that is where we are going to get the benefits mm. um, on civilian protections and reduction of harms and mitigate some of the risks and some of the concerns, those valid concerns that we've heard articulated. There's never enough time to deal with all these substantive issues, but Kirsten Vignard and Michael Ruska, let me thank you for just taking us through the maze. We're not done here on our online program. We'll continue to discuss the use of artificial intelligence in the military domain and bring you all the debates. We want you to stay with us. In just a few minutes, we are going to go live to the academic consortium and just see what angles are going to to be uh, uh, articulated there, are going to be debated there. But before we do that, let's just revisit how this morning started, just some clips and some commentary around how this summit began this morning. Have a look.
Can I ask you where you're from? I'm from Italy. Uh, from Australia, from the University of Queensland. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm from the US. I'm from Australia. You're attending the conference. Why are you here? Because I am the managing partner of a responsible AI consultancy and we're here to for a talk as well and to meet people, talk about responsible AI, especially in the military domain. Well, I'm very interested in the ethics and the government about AI because uh, AI, well, it can be used in a good way and can be used in a bad way. So that's why I'm attending this, uh, this congress. Mm -hmm. Military and uh, defense is, well, there's a chance that it's going up the wrong way, in fact. Mm -hmm. so Are you afraid of that? A little, yes, yes. So that's a, the second reason why I attend this, uh, this Congress. Artificial intelligence has the ability to really get a lot of extreme perspectives or opinions. So there are some who think, look, uh, it's going to be killer robots, we're going to lose all human control, and there might be some sort of terrible loss of dignity or humanity with the use of artificial intelligence in a military context of use. But others might say, well, look, yes, that's possible, but also we could use it to augment human intelligence and decision making and make our militaries more hum humanitarian and look after protected objects and things. So because you have a lot of that um, differences of opinion, you want a place online where people can share their thoughts, mm -hmm. um, be treated with integrity and dignity, but that those ideas are evaluated based on evidence mm -hmm. and the degree to which the, uh, the collective, all of us, can discuss the ideas. It's collective intelligence, not artificial intelligence. I'm a data scientist. And I'm wondering what direction we are going towards uh, in the with AI in the military domain and uh, what's happening there. So that's why I'm here. And is there a special session you would like to attend or something you would like to learn or see here? I'm especially interested in AI in practice sessions. Uh, there are a few of them um, because I'm from the uh, practice, so that's what I'm here for. Why are you attending ReAIM? Well, I'll be presenting on uh, value sense of design for AI in the military. So, how can we design these technologies, these potentially dangerous technologies, for human values rather than waiting for something to go wrong first? Uh, sorry, I'm an international lawyer, and my group, the Law and Future of War Research Program, uh, looks at AI and regulatory and legal requirements related to AI and the military. And I'm moderating a panel on cybersecurity today. Okay, and so what is your session about? Um, what we need to do in terms of securing um, autonomous weapon systems in the cyberspace. Uh, what do you consider uh, can be the dangers of using AI in the military domain? Well, I think one of the main dangers is the ability for us to lose meaningful human control when we focus a little bit too much on what the system itself can or cannot do instead of looking at where the system can and cannot do those things. When we forget that the context is actually what really, really matters. Context is king when it comes to AI in the military. What do you hope to take away with you when you leave uh, on uh, well tomorrow? To see what the, you know what uh, everyone is saying, what how we should be addressing these issues, what the consensus is, and how we should be uh, addressing AI to uphold our democratic values. The people who are coming here want to do something with AI in a responsible way. So, meet, uh, getting new ideas, uh, sharing ideas is what I'm here for. Well, I'm hoping that the people who are listening in particular and those policymakers really look at that there are means of achieving meaningful or significant responsibility when it comes to AI in the military. And that really looks, that, that means looking at the entire social technical infrastructure, not only at the system itself, but who are the people interacting with the system, who are, what are the institutions interacting with the system. And I think that control of how do we actually have responsibility means looking across the entire social technical infrastructure. I think recognizing the challenges and opportunities that um, are in place in terms of autonomous weapon systems and cybersecurity uh, compared to existing systems that are in place at the moment. Also talking about some of the challenges um, that defense industry face in making sure that when they're designing and developing these systems, they have appropriate security systems from a cyber perspective around them. The opportunity to listen and to hear a lot more diverse opinions and to understand each other better, I think is the first best next step for a global approach to AI governance. Yeah, because this is actually the first summit that's being organized. It's really inspiring that the Netherlands has decided to run this summit and I can't wait to participate when it starts at nine o'clock.
What do you think AI is and does? It's artificial intelligence, but as a philosopher, I would not say it's intelligence. Something to do with machines and intelligence. Artificial intelligence, mostly algorithms. Certain robots can do certain operations instead of the human being. Artificial intelligence would be having a robot, a vacuum cleaner. Generally, I would just say computing, things made by computers. I mean, it's crazy how much is being implemented. Pretty much more than most people realize, I think. More than I realize, probably. It's everywhere. If you search Google, it uses uh, artificial intelligence uh, and it keeps improving its performance. It's in your pocket, it's on your phone, and it's uh, also used in industry, for example, in retail, in uh, order picking and sorting products together with robot hands. AI is about making machines intelligent. Historically, it is machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. We're increasingly changing that to machines whose actions can be expected to achieve our objectives. One day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossils. There's a lot of hype that comes with both robotics and AI. It's lots of fun to work in the domain, but it's not nearly where the movies portray it. So, you know, people are a little disappointed, you know, why is that robot slow or how come that AI is not so good? Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to that, but uh, it's still amazing technology. It's lots of fun to work with. I am worried because if it's too much of it, then you, there might be unemployment for a lot of people, you know because machines will be doing the work instead of the people. For me, it's not that scary. I mean, I kind of grew up in social media and, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm very worried about killer robots, just generally like the whole drone industry. Things like deep fakes scare me a lot. I would say human extinction. So the risks that are happening right now are AI systems that perform in unintended ways uh, partly because of careless design. So, for example, uh, you can train machine learning systems to uh, filter resumes, and they will often uh, filter out the resumes of women uh, for a tech job, for example. We're also seeing risks from social media algorithms, the recommender systems that fill your news feed or your YouTube video sequence, that are learning how to manipulate people over time to change people into more predictable consumers of whatever material they can supply. Uh, in the longer term, we are most concerned about the risk of losing control that will build AI systems that are pursuing incorrectly specified objectives that then prevent us from interfering uh, with that pursuit, so we end up losing control to the machines. The biggest risk is, is that we stop to be able to bear responsibility because you are using instruments and tools that we don't understand. And if people ask us, what have you done, that uh, we cannot answer that question uh, satisfactorily. We need to put the brakes on a little bit, slow down and like talk about it and think about, have these discussions, what might happen. Many people are uh, moving the potential date for general purpose intelligence closer to the present than they were before. And I think some people are even talking about the next five years. We're not going to have sentient AI. Uh, you know, this is part of the hype, right? And so that'll probably disappoint some people. I'm sure there'll be some people that disagree with me on that one. So far, history is on my side. And no, these are just machines at the end of the day. They're programmed by people, for people. So the holy grail is explainable AI. So how can we human beings understand what is happening inside? How can we bear responsibility for the outcomes uh, while at the same time using those powerful machines? We developed this prototype in order to help the commander which is in the field in determining a good course of action. We analyze satellite images and other data sources to create a 3D terrain of the mission area for the use of the commander. There are several characteristics that are very different between the civil domain and the military domain when it comes to AI. In the civil domain you often have a lot of data and you have a controlled environment. 
While in the military domain, there often is no data and you're in an open environment. The enemy is not providing you with any data and anything can happen in the real world that you didn't expect. That's also why we have to do these feasibility studies in order to experience in what conditions AI can work and in what conditions AI cannot work yet. We use this 3D mission area for various military simulations. These prototypes have as goal to support the commander in time-critical situations. So the enemy is approaching, you have to decide now what the best plan is. What currently is happening, you rely on your experience, on your training and on your intuition. Such a prototype, it helps you in thinking of other options that you did not think of. Or it confirms that the plan that you thought of yourself is indeed a good plan. The great promise of AI is it will solve every, everything. That's absolutely not true. You have to work hard to define your problem space, develop your training data. The AI is not an entity that can decide on itself what to do. You have to manually configure what it does. The human aspect is very important in the military domain. You want to make sure that decisions are not being made autonomously by future AI systems, but you want a human either in the loop or on the loop so that there's always a control mechanism to reject any wrong decisions that the AI can make. There's always a risk that the user of such an AI system will start to blindly trust the AI system. We uh, recognize this risk, so we also design the system in a way that we make sure that the commander is not too dependent on this future system. Thank you so much for staying with us on our online program at the Re-Aim Summit at The Hague in the Netherlands. I'm outside the Mississippi room where a breakout session is going to start. Now listen to this. This is the title of the breakout sessions. Realities of Algorithmic Warfare. Impact and regulation. And that's what the delegates here are going to be discussing. But we are here to just break it all down for you, to simplify it, to bring you all the live discussions as they take place. You can see people starting to walk in, panel discussions are getting ready, but I'm interested in what the audience members have to say about what is happening here this morning. Let's just get a few comments and I'm going to pick on this gentleman first. Good morning to you, sir. Arinze Ofodile, AG Ofodile Enterprises. Why are you here? Good morning. Two reasons, I'm here for professional networking and academic engagement. Okay. Professional networking and academic engagement. So you see, it is quite an eclectic mix of people and speakers. And you, ma'am, Roberta N. Har, uh, Maastricht University. Why are you here? Well, likewise, I'm an academic at Maastricht University, professor there. And I'm, I have been fortunate to have a EU Horizon grant that's going to be researching, researching uh, governance and multilateralism. And so I'm very much interested in, in, from an academic point of view, regulations on AI. So that's why I'm here. Do you think ordinary people should take an interest in the summit? Oh yes, because I think that they, it will affect everyone. and uh, um, AI will affect everyone in some way. It already affects people with facial recognition software and certainly it affects them in how the military is going to be developed. And just from the panel discussions you attended, were there some new things that stood out for you? There certainly were for me as I was watching and listening, especially conversations around AI and biases and so on. What did you find interesting? Uh, the Secretary General of the Ar of Amnesty International had a position whereby autonomous systems should be, uh, human interaction should be integrated or it should be um, not allowed. But I think when warfare starts and the enemy has autonomous systems operating, they're going to make decisions faster, while systems where human beings are integrated is going to be slower. So I think there's a disadvantage there, but it's a good uh, topic. Thank you so much. So those are some of the thoughts and the comments that are coming through and algorithms being a very big thing in our lives, in our everyday lives. We heard that from the first panel that, that happened, but how is it integrated and used in the military? And to make sure that um, artificial intelligence within the military domain is used for greater good, not just for the protection of civilians, but also for the upkeep of peace and security. But the role of the human in this entire 
entire domain is also very important. And those are some of the discussions that will be coming through. So we are right here at the Mississippi Room. The panel is getting ready to take to the floor. The delegates from all walks of life are coming through and they will be having these discussions in just a moment. Stay with us here on our online program coming to you live from The Hague in the Netherlands. This is the Re-AIM Summit. So just take a feel of, of the room as the delegates are getting ready for their discussions this morning.